a, a title that I've given to this series. By the way, uh, in the back, can you hear me okay? Okay. Yeah, if, if you have trouble, I would rather be down here than, than up there because I like to walk. And, and if I'm not careful, I'll walk right off that thing. And that wouldn't be good. My bones are too old, you know. I'm not that old, but they're old enough it would hurt. So, so if, you, if you have trouble hearing or something, there's some seats up here and so on. So just move forward. I, I, we've been talking about this thing called faith, and I've entitled this series, um, uh, Finding Faith in Unlikely Places. Uh, we talked a little bit about the difference between faith as a roadmap uh, last week and, uh, and as a journey and as a way that God puts us on. And tonight, the title of my message is, You Are What You See. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, You Are What You Eat? I hope it ain't so. <laughs> I, I, if it is, I got, I've got to get some eating habits in line. I'm afraid it might be true. But anyway... Uh, the one thing that is true is that you are what you see from the standpoint of something spiritual and the standpoint of faith. And I don't know about you, but when people talk about faith, uh, uh, someone mentions the idea of faith, it, it often strikes different people different ways. You, know, you think about different things. And some people don't even like to hear a message on faith uh, because they've got to, maybe they associate it with a movement or something of that sort. But I tell you, Jesus talked about faith more than anybody. Uh, he was constantly talking about faith, and uh, faith is something that we can see that will operate in our lives that will enable us to change our world and change the world around us, not just to get things, but to get where God wants us to go. I mean, there's some powerful statements about faith. Uh, Hebrews 11:6. without faith, it is impossible to believe or, or to please God. And so faith must be pretty important. If it's impossible to please God, we've got to have, if we want to please Him, we've got to walk by faith. The Bible says that faith is not something that we exercise in times of an emergency. It's not something that all of a sudden things go wrong, and boy, I've got to have faith for this. Nor is faith something that we exercise whenever we need something, or we want to try to get something uh, to improve our quality of life, or to get us out of a jam. Faith is none of those things. The Bible says we live by faith, the just shall live by faith. And so faith must be important. And it, and it must be important for the walk and the journey that God has for each one of us. So let's just bow our heads and uh, uh, because I'm, I'm just going to draw your attention to something basic tonight. And let's ask God to illuminate us. I've entitled it, as I said, You Are What You See. I'm talking to you tonight about spiritual eyesight. God wants us to have spiritual eyesight. He wants to sharpen those eyes so we can see further and stronger and more clearly. And uh, God has pronounced throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament the importance and value of spiritual eyesight. So let's, let's just ask God if he would illuminate us tonight. Now, that it would, wouldn't be something that I teach or we just get some Bible knowledge, but something would happen to us spirit to spirit that some way God would touch us in a way that we, we weren't touched when we came in tonight. Maybe that's a tall order, but I believe God wants to do it. I believe he does. I believe he wants to do it every time we come together, as a matter of fact. Don't you? And I tell you what we're really looking for is a revelation of him. That we might see him more clearly. We might be drawn to him, uh, more, being more committed, and uh, we might experience more of him than we presently are. Jesus, I'm asking you to touch us in this place to illuminate us, not by human wisdom and our own eyesight, but, Lord, that you'd give us spiritual eyes to see. And I pray, Lord, that you would begin now uh, to quicken us. There is something that you have for every one of us in this auditorium to achieve. Uh, you literally do have a plan for our lives. And you want us, Lord, to achieve and to grab hold, as Paul said, that which is the high calling, the prize of the upward call that you've given to each one of us, not necessarily to be a, um, a minister that preaches or teaches or, or even uh, uh, someone who has a ministry of healing or evangelism, but, Lord, that you would lay hold of us, that somehow we would, by faith, have the strength to step forward and lay hold of the path, the way that you've called each one of us to, and that we would not miss, we would not stand before you one day and have missed what you've called us to be. I pray, God, that this would be, this series would be a step in that direction. 
Lord, we ask you by the power of the Holy Spirit, let the word come alive and change us, transform us in your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, I'm going to just lay, first of all, a very simple principle uh, that we can begin to follow and look to. A very, very simple principle, something that everybody here knows. And that is, first of all, that we live in two worlds. You know, we live in two worlds, not one world. We live in two worlds. In fact, we probably live in more than that. Uh, everybody has a, a, a world in which they, they work in. That's one world. And you have a world at home, your family that's, and your friends. That's another world, an intimate world. But I'm, I'm breaking it uh, down not quite that much. We live in a physical, material world, and we live in a spiritual world. Now, I want to tell you something. Even though we don't feel it, the spiritual world is more reality than the physical world that we have. Because I tell you what, if, if, for example, there would be, say, a thermonuclear attack on the United States, and somehow that uh, a, a, a bomb was detonated uh, anywhere near Pensacola, then everything you're seeing here, including us, would just be obliterated. I mean, even if it were several miles away, this building wouldn't be standing. I mean, stone is melted. Concrete is just, you know, it's just, it disintegrates the heat of, of the thermonuclear energy and warheads that we have today are so incredibly powerful that the very heat hundreds of miles away uh, can just dissolve flesh right off the bone and the bone as well, just like that. But should that happen, the spiritual world would still be intact. It wouldn't be blown up. Isn't that good to know? Because as a Christian, we live primarily in the spiritual world. Now, it's difficult. It's very, very difficult uh, to, to equate that. I know there's a place, for example, in, I think it was in South Dakota that my wife and my children went to, and, and they called it, what did they call that place? It had everything wild and crazy and upside down and rooms you would walk into. It was, it was something that they did with your eyes. I mean, you'd walk into this room, and you automatically started leaning like this because they had painted the walls and they slanted everything and then then there was a, you know you'd stand on on, on things and it, it was an optical illusion is the point i'm making so that you felt absolutely disoriented you know and you, one room i remember you walked into and i mean i'm not very tall this was kind of fun for me but you walked in and you ducked because you thought you were going to hit the ceiling you weren't anywhere close to the ceiling but it was an optical illusion and and so there's there's something that can happen with the eyes that makes us see what we think we're seeing is not really what's there. And, and when we look at the material world we live in, it's so easy to get inundated every day with how we feel and, and what things look like and what they appear to be. When If we compare that natural world with the physical world, we're not seeing correctly at all. How, how many of you have ever been right at the place, how many have ever uttered this, I'm not going to make it? How many have ever said that, you know? Come on now. I mean, five or six of us. <laughs> yeah. I mean, or you've said something like that. You know, oh, it's just, this is too much for me. Anybody ever heard of that? This is just, I can't take anymore. <laughs> now, some of you are starting to get real honest, okay? In fact, some of your hands are going up on every one of them. Right? That, that's all right. That's good. See, but you're still here. <laughs> And somehow, your perception that you couldn't take anymore was wrong because you're here. And you're not gone yet. And so the way we look at things, if we can learn to look through spiritual eyes, spiritual eyes, not physical eyes, but spiritual eyes, God says we can see something that others don't see. Faith is an eye. Faith has an eye. It sees what others do not see. And of course, one of the most classic examples of that would be in the Old Testament whenever Elisha is at Dothan. That's not Dothan, Alabama. But he was at Dothan. And, and so he had a servant that walked outside and looked up and here, here were these armies all around. They were just, they were everywhere. And by the way, the city where they were, it had no walls. There was no protection. So he runs back in the house and he tells the prophet Elisha, he said, hey, we're finished. We're doomed. I mean, we're overrun. What are we going to do? What should we do? Cry or give up? And so he runs in and he's all concerned. And, but Elisha says, walks him outside and says, open his eyes, Lord. And when he opened his eyes, the hills were filled with angelic chariots and warriors all around about them, see? And so greater 
was those were those that were with them than were with than the enemy. And so if we can have our eyes open to see what God sees, you know, uh, it's, it's just real. Uh, uh, I, I really liked what John Cava said the other day, one Wednesday. He, he, and this just really impacted me. I haven't forgotten it, but he, was, he made a statement that I think is very, very powerful. He said, you know, we know things God doesn't know. And uh, I wondered where he was going to go with that. He said, we know a lot of things God doesn't know. He said, for example, we, we call a disease incurable. God says, I didn't know that. <laughs> Or, or when we call a situation helpless, God says, I didn't know that. didn't realize that. And, and so God sees things that we don't see. The Bible says that when we became born again, that we, were, we inherited a capacity. Now listen to me. A capacity to see. That doesn't mean that we'll see it. We inherited a capacity to see. Ephesians 1.3 says that we, those who have been born again, have been blessed. Now listen to this with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. How many think you've got them all? <laughs> well, in God's, in God, from God's viewpoint, they're there. They're, we, we, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. Yet, we know we have not inherited from the standpoint of experience those blessings. There are, there's much more that God wants us to see. And the avenue by which those things will become a reality in our lives is this thing that God calls faith. Faith. And uh, the Bible says in John 3, 3, that unless we are born again, we cannot even see the kingdom of God. We can't see it. We can't know the things that are there. We can't know what's there. And so there's this physical and spiritual world. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying. How many of you have your outer man decaying just a little bit? Though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't necessarily feel like I'm being renewed every day day by day, but God is doing something in us. If we're following God and walking with God, I want you to understand you're growing spiritually. If you're in the Word, consistent in the Word, and asking God to show you, if you're in prayer and you're asking God to, to, to open Himself up, reveal Himself to you, I'm telling you, I don't care how your body feels, I don't care what's taking place, if you're following with God, walking with Him, you know, and keeping the sin out, and just obeying God, growing, I want you to understand that you are being renewed every day day by day by day. There's a spiritual change that's taking place according to this word. For a momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Now I want you to keep that thing in mind for just a moment. Far beyond all comparison. Um, we're going to look at something in just a minute. While we look not at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, here's the two worlds. He's talking about two worlds. You may go through a, a, an affliction, and to you, it might seem very, very, very heavy. It might seem almost too much for you to handle. It might seem too big for you, but it all depends on what you're comparing it with. Now, I'm not talking about comparing it with somebody else's trial. It depends on whether or not you're comparing it with the physical world or the eternal, the spiritual world. See, if you keep your eyes on the physical world, then hardship is tough, and it will become tougher. But if you begin to look at the spiritual world, and I'm not just talking about heaven, but if you start looking at what God can do with what you're going through and what God can produce in your life, and what his purposes are. And as we sang the song, he is in charge. He's directing. He's in control. I don't believe God causes everything, but I don't believe he ever loses control of anything. So if I'm able to then see God in the midst of my circumstances, whatever they are, it changes everything. Now, he talks about a comparison here. I want you to think about uh, comparisons because, in fact, I want you to turn uh, in your Bibles to 2 uh, Corinthians uh, chapter... Um, Turn, turn with me to uh, chapter 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Because tonight we're going to look at some things. 
a statement that he makes here. While you're in chapter 10, I just want to read to you again what I read in chapter 4. Therefore, we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Now stay in 2 Corinthians 10. For momentary, light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. Listen to this. Far beyond all comparison. And then he says, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Now that's a strange statement. We read that and we don't think too much about it. But he's saying, you know, the world will think you're crazy if you talk like that. For we're looking at things that you can't see. I've got my eyes on things that are invisible. You see, it doesn't compute. How many of you are following what I'm saying? It does not compute to the natural world. You know, I remember when, when, uh, uh, when I was a little kid, some of you may have played a game like this. I, I, all I remember is the little phrase that went with it. I see what you don't see. Uh, have you ever played anything like that? Okay. Okay, now I, I, I'm, I know I'm older than some of you. But I'm not as old as some of you. Okay. Now, we used to play this little game in the car or something like, I see what you don't see, and it is, and you would give some description, you know, something like that. And, and so the whole idea was that you, I see something that you don't see. Well, God says to us, I see something you don't see. But I do want you to see it. I want you to see it. I want you to be a part of it. And, and so the Bible says there's a comparison that we can make. Now, let me show you, first of all, the wrong kind of comparisons. And if we don't walk by faith, then this is what we're using as the standard of our measure. Did you know God measures things differently than we do? And he says this, for example, in Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For to each, that means every born-again person in this room, for to each he has given a measure of faith. Now, can I tell you that that measure can grow? God intends he's given. There's no such thing as a born-again person without faith. There's no such thing. So don't ever say, I don't have any faith. Because if you're born again, you have a measure of faith. And, and, and you can build on it. You can act on it. You can cause it to grow. As a matter of fact, I, I really believe that whether you succeed or whether you fail, that God is at work in your life to increase the measure of your faith. You know, you don't have to just succeed in order to increase your faith. Sometimes you can learn some things about what you did wrong. And you can grow with God if you keep your eyes on Him and the very things that that caused you to stumble, God can use to cause you to have enough faith to get back up. He can do something with a spiritual fight in you that will be something that you didn't have before and you can begin to see what you've never seen before. Now, comparison. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. For we are not bold to class or compare ourselves with some of these who can commend themselves but when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are without understanding. Now, he, he talks about two measures. And we, we do this sometimes. Now, first of all, we can compare ourselves to ourselves. How many of you have ever done that? How many of you have ever looked at yourself and just didn't like what you saw? Yeah. How, how many of you looked at yourself and saw more than what was there? <laughs> And God corrects that, doesn't he? But sometimes we compare ourselves with ourselves. For example, if we failed in something, we have a tendency to believe that we probably won't be able to succeed in it the next time. It sets in. Or if we've never experienced something, we're a little reluctant to step out because we begin to look at ourselves, comparing ourselves with ourselves, and we begin to think, you know, I just, I don't know if I could ever do it. Now, all of us have experienced that probably in some degree or another. There's another comparison that's just as dangerous, and that's to compare yourself with somebody else. Because you're either going to look good or bad based on their ability or what they've experienced or what they've been through, how they look, how they don't look. So when you start making those comparisons, you are killing faith because you're comparing things in the world in which you live. Faith lives in another realm. Now, I'm not getting spooky and I'm not getting mystical, but it's real. Faith lives in another realm. So when you start comparing things based upon yourself or others, I want you to know even hardship. I mean, Peter did that. Jesus told him that he was going to be girded about and he was going to be taken in a way that he didn't want to go. And his first reaction 
is to turn around and look down the seashore on the beach at John and say, what about him? Yeah. See, he was going to go through something. It's, I, and I've been there. I've been there. But God, is there anybody else that's going to go through this with me? Lord, have you taken anybody else this same path? Lord, uh, why is it that I seem to be having this battle and Richard seems to be skating right on through life? Why is it? You look at somebody else. See, but you don't know what everybody else is going through. You don't know what's happening on the inside. You don't know if they got a Colgate grin or if it's a real grin, you know. You don't know that. And so what happens is that you make a big mistake and you kill faith when you start making a comparison about your ability, what you've experienced, what's happened to you, what's going on with you, what your circumstances say. And that's where this thing called faith comes in. So, so if we're going to measure, not compare ourselves with ourselves and by ourselves, what in the world are we going to measure ourselves with? Well, there are some things, for example, um, that we're going to look at in Ephesians in a moment. But, but first of all, I, I think of, the, one, of the, one of the most in, uh, incredible, incredible comparisons is a woman by the name of Mary. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the Holy Spirit begins to introduce himself to Mary. Begins to overshadow her. She has never experienced this before. She, she's a virgin. And she's going to have a baby. Now, I mean, that's, that's something, we, we read the story, but I mean, can you imagine the first time this, I mean, it's the first and only time, but when this happened, can you imagine what went through her mind? Can, can you, in fact, she said, how can this be? Now, it almost seems too simple. I mean, the Bible does tell us if God had recorded everything that took place, there wouldn't be enough volumes to contain it. So I don't believe that you just jump to the next verse and the Holy Spirit shall overshadow you. And she just said, okay. I don't believe it worked that way with her. I believe she struggled. I believe she said, what is the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Let's start there first. <laughs> I know overshadow, but what does that mean? And when she gets that explanation, I believe she still says, I don't understand how. But in verse 45 of Luke chapter 1, it says, Blessed is she who has believed that which was spoken to her by the Lord. See, what happened was at some place, some way, somehow, she was able to believe something that she was not before. Now, the Bible indicates that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But can I tell you something else that it speaks about predominantly? is seeing. Seeing with spiritual eyes. Now, so we, we first of all should measure our comparisons by the Word of God, not by anything else. But what does God have to say about this impossibility? What does God have to say? You know, I try to tell people we need a new, fresh conception of grace. I'm teaching the students at the school. We've got to have a fresh conception of grace. Grace, in the tradition that I was brought up in, was, was just sort of unmerited favor. It's like God just passed a magic wand over you some way and you were forgiven. Now, we tied it to the cross. But you see, when you start reading about grace, Paul starts about the fact that he labored by grace. He said that the mystery, the stewardship of the mystery of the gospel going to the Gentiles, he said it was given to him by grace. It says he ministered it by grace. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9 8 tells us that grace is a power that enables us to do whatever God calls us to do. So if you think about this, whatever God ever asks you to do, whether it's a vision that's of Him, whether it's an act of obedience to His Word, does not matter. Anything God ever asks you to do, He pledges the grace, the ability to do it. He never sends you out and says, just go do it. In fact, when somebody insults you and hurts you and wounds you, and God says, forgive them, he doesn't just say, okay, now just go forgive them. Like, like go, uh, go push around a big block, you know, of stone somewhere. He doesn't, he doesn't say, just do the best you can. What he does is the moment he sees a heart of obedience, step toward his word and step toward his will. From that moment, God begins to do a work on the inside to will 
to give you the desire to obey and to work to do it. So you're never left in a situation where you have to obey God with your own willpower. However, however, there is that initial movement toward God that surrenders to God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I mean, this is a very thin line that we need to capture it. And, and, and I'm, saying, I'm not saying that you sit back and say, okay, God, make me do it. That doesn't work. But I'm saying when God sees a heart of surrender to him, when he sees a heart ready to step out, no matter how much fear there is, no matter how much difficulty, no matter how much questioning, no matter how much uh, the flesh says, I don't want to, and God sees that heart make one step toward him, just, just starts moving in that direction, then he begins to come with an enabling power to be able to do it. Okay? Now, that's glorious to me. You see, but it's also frightening because it takes away my I can't. You understand me? I can never say, I can't obey you, God. I can never, yeah, His grace is sufficient, always. I can't ever say that. No matter what it is, I can't say, God, I understand what you're telling me. It's a pretty tough task. I can't do it. Like John Cobble would say, God says, I didn't know that. I thought I'd supplied everything you needed to every command I give. So God, we, we can say, I won't. But we can never say, I can't, to whatever God tells us. See, and if you say, I won't, then God can work with you if you're honest with it. If you say, I can't, then you're closing God out to doing anything with you. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's better to say, I won't, and let God. You know, there were two stewards that Jesus told about, two, two servants. And, and uh, he came to them with something to do, and one of them said, I'll do it. But he didn't do it. And the other one said, I won't do it. But later he came back and said, God, I will do it. You see? So what God is more interested in is when we're honest with him and we say to him, God, by faith, by faith. I mean, I'm having a struggle. My flesh says no. My heart says yes. But by faith, I step out. And when we do that, God's grace comes to work on our behalf to strengthen us, to enable us to do what he's asked us to do. All right? Now, with that in mind, I want you to see what makes the deciding factor. Uh, I, I mentioned the, some things that we'll talk about that are God's measures. Uh, Romans 12, 3 says, to each he gives the measure of faith. But, but at the same time, uh, there's, there's something that works. God's will. God's will is one of his measures. Uh, 1 John 5, 14 says, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears us, if we know that he hears us, we know that we have received that for which we've asked. God measures things according to his will. He measures things according to his word, as I said with Mary. Um, but there's some other things that he uses. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians. How does God measure? How should we measure what God's told us to do? Now, I, I, I want to, before I get into this part, I, I want you to see something. Um, the Bible constantly uses words that you'll be familiar with. For example, he talks about, uh, in Proverbs, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Um, he talks about the inner man. In fact, he talks about women in a different way than he does men. Have you noticed that? He, for example, he tells when he warns when he warns men to be sure that you treat you pray for your wives and you and you and you treat your wives in the right manner. If you don't, your prayers will be hindered. He, he talks about women and saying it's the hidden person of the heart that he takes pleasure in, and he speaks of women having a gentle and quiet spirit. Now, uh, I've met some women that didn't fit that category. Now, my wife's not one. I mean, she is gentle and quiet. She, she, but, but, but I've seen some women that weren't that. But what he's saying is that inside the woman, I believe this. Have you ever wondered why? Uh, you know, I, I came from a denomination that did not allow the women to do anything. But they did everything. Because you couldn't find any men to do it. <laughs> so, I, I was in upstate New York and... Uh, my wife, was, my wife was with me, I think, on this trip. Were you? I don't remember. 
But, but at any rate, there was a bunch of young people. They, they had reserved uh, several seats for the young people, and they, Richard, they were singing this song, and you know, it's, it, it goes like this. It says that, uh, um, for the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And they, they go like this. And, they, and then they'd say, uh, the righteous run into it, and they'd all go like this. And they are safe. See, they made a baseball sign, safe, you know, like this. I noticed a distinct difference. The women, the women were singing it like this. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are safe. Okay, and here's what the guys were doing. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they're safe. And I thought, you know, that really is a spiritual truth. Because <laughs> it seems like with us men, it, it takes that, you know. Where sometimes with the women, it just, it's a little thing like this. Uh, uh. <laughs> but, but I want you to understand that God has promised to give us something called spiritual eyes. If you look with me at Ephesians chapter 1, he says, For this reason, verse 15, Paul's writing to these Christians at Ephesus. And he says, for this reason, I too, having heard of the faith, now he heard about their faith, in the Lord Jesus which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. I tell you, Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter uh, 2 I'm telling you, they, uh, Ephesians chapter 3, have some most beautiful prayers that you'll find anywhere in the Bible. In fact, before we go on with this one, let's just look at the one in Ephesians 3, just, just a moment. Verse 14. For this reason, I bow my, this is chapter 3, verse 14. I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Now, that's another measurement of God. God measures by the riches of his glory. I heard somebody say one time, I don't know who it was, that the Bible says according to his riches. It never says out of his riches. See, a lot of times, if my children come to me and they ask me for uh, some money to go somewhere, I, I might give them, you know, $5 or something. I'm giving them, I wouldn't exactly call them riches, but I'm giving them out of my funds, okay? Out of. You know, I didn't, I didn't give them the whole thing. If, if I gave them according to, I would simply open the bank account, the checkbook, empty my pockets, every bit of cash that my wife or I had and everything there, they could choose what they wanted for their outing. You get the difference? God never says that I will give to you out of my riches. Now that's interesting to me because it seems to me like what God is saying is that I want to give you according to, which means that whatever you need for the moment, that's what you have to draw from. It's not what I'm just going to pour out to you, but whatever you can gather according to is better than out of. Does that make sense? All right, now, faith is looking to God. We're, we have a measure that God says that whatever we experience, whatever we go through, we can draw from God, not out of, but according to whatever that is. Whatever it stands for, whatever resources he has, then that's what we measure, what we can draw from. Okay? Now, the reason I say that is because the Bible talks about going from faith to faith, from strength to strength. See, uh, uh, from grace to grace. So there's, uh, there ought to be in our lives a constant growth of this thing called faith. We should have more of an exercise of faith next year than we had this year. It shouldn't ever be the same. Because even though we can draw according to, we have to grow in faith. The Bible talks about growing in faith. See, if you could understand this, he gave you a deposit, which he called a measure of faith. And that measure of faith that you have within you, you have it. You have it. 
you, you may you may feel sometimes feel like it was little faith but you know every time in the Bible there's four times in the Bible four times in the New Testament where Jesus accused the disciples of having little faith four times and in every case he went ahead and did something for them anyway and in every case he brought a fresh revelation of what he could do or who he was now you know what that indicates to me that indicates that even though I may be in a position where I have little faith God does not turn me away he doesn't measure me by the fact that I just that I failed or that I disappointed him and I, I know what it's like to disappoint God but I also know what it's like to be drawn back in to his graces so that he begins to deal with me and bring a fresh revelation of himself now the point is that the way God has chosen for our faith to grow is not through natural eyes, but through spiritual eyes. All right, now let me give you a little phrase. Psalm 103 um, makes this statement. It says that the children of Israel saw the acts of God. Moses knew the ways of God. Now, what do you think that means? Well, I, I tell you what it's telling us, that if we learn to operate only on the acts of God, then we're no better than what we saw God do the last time. Do you hear me? Yes. If God did something for you, you're able to grow only so far as you see God do something again. Moses wasn't like that. Moses knew the ways of God. See, he didn't have to have an act of God. If God didn't come through with a certain act... Moses was able to live off of the ways of God. He understood what God was like. He could see more than what God did. Friend, I want to tell you something. I think we've misinterpreted a lot of what God said when he told Moses. Moses said, I want to behold your glory. And God put him in the cleft of the rock. And he said, you cannot see, you cannot see the fullness of my glory, just the backside. Well, I want to use a little play on words. All God could do at that point was show him the backside of the cross. Are you hearing me? He couldn't show him where the cross was going to go. But what he did for Moses, see, all he could see was up to the cross. Moses could not see the full glory of God because he wasn't able to. Jesus had not come yet. And he is the glory of God. Had he seen Jesus in his fullness at that point without being incarnate, he would have killed him just like that. It would have been the raw glory of God and he couldn't stand it. So he let him see the backside of the cross. But God never forgets. When you, it's amazing to me. When you ask God to do something for you, how many of you have ever noticed that you've asked God to do something for you and you forgot all about it because it didn't come to pass when you thought it was supposed to? And then all of a sudden, several years down the road, pop, there it is. He did it for you. How many of you have ever had that experience? Well, I love this with Moses because what happened to Moses? Moses said, God, I'm so hungry. Don't take us into the promised land if you're not going to go with us. Just, we'll stay right here if your presence. Don't, get, don't send us an angel. I want you. I don't want some experience. I don't want something else. I want you. And God says, Moses, that's exactly what I'm looking for in my people. But because of your time in history, I can only show you the backside of my cross. Now, you know what he was asking to see? Don't, don't think he was asking to see some blinding light flying by a rock, Okay. Now, when he said he wanted to see the glory of God, he was saying, I want to know you, God. It's knowledge. See, God doesn't just flash an experience. He teaches us knowledge. So we're, we're grounded and we're rooted and grounded in him. But now look, look at what happened. God is so good. I mean, God is so good. He, he, he says, Moses, you can't do it. You're not in the era of time where you can see that yet. But guess what happens? Jesus on the front side of the cross <laughs> is on a place called the Mount of Transfiguration. <laughs> and guess who shows up? <laughs> Moses is one of them. And he shows it. And guess what they're talking about? They're talking about his death that was to come. You see, God honored Moses' request because of the hunger that was there. Faith, what faith I'm convinced is designed to do. Now listen to me when I say that. It's designed, faith is designed to give us a fresh vision, not just what God can do, but of Him. And with that, He produces a desire and an expectancy. Listen, when faith gets hold of you, you start feeling something you didn't feel before. 
there's an expectancy that begins to rise up on the inside of you. All right, now, having said that, let's, let's, uh, let's look at what he says, verse 16 of chapter 3, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the what? Inner man. Now, you have some capacity. I, I'm not going to try to explain this because I don't know how to explain it. I don't know where the inner man is located. I don't know how to describe it, but you have, and I have, the moment you're born again, you have an inner capacity to have faith and to see with eyes that are not normal eyes. Look at chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. Or, excuse me, uh, verse 16. I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. Now, you know something? How's He going to do that? Verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Now, let's stop right there. It, it literally, I think it literally says that the, that the eyes, I think the King J says the eyes of your understanding, doesn't it? Uh, it, means, uh, it means eyes for seeing the invisible. He's praying for these people. He said, I've heard about your faith. And now that I've heard about your faith, I am praying that you would begin to have eyes for spirituals, eyes for the invisible, and you'd begin to see some things. Now look at what they begin to see. First of all, I want you to notice what he says about this. Does this strike you as a, this? I don't know. It just struck me as funny. Or different, not funny. Verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom. Look, you know, I would have turned that around. Maybe this is no big deal with you, but as a teacher, I just ponder sometimes little bitty things. And I would have expected him to say, in fact, this is the only place in the Bible where he uses this phraseology. The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. See, what I would, most of the time, that's turned around. And he talks about this. He talks about the God of glory and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see? He talks about this relationship. Now, what he's saying here is the God of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, I think he's indicating something. First of all, putting Father and glory together. When you talk about God's glory, God's glory has the capacity of knocking the strongest, holiest, most spiritual, cleanest, purest saint flat on his or her face, just coming into his glory. The glory of God has the ability to subdue us. I mean, in fact, if you read the accounts of those people who came face to face with Jesus, you go all the way back. It doesn't matter who you pick. The encounter was always the same. They fell on their face. Ezekiel fell on his face. Moses fell on his face. Daniel fell on his face. John on the Isle of Patmos fell on his face. John used to lean his head against his breast at the table, sees him in his glory, and he falls on his face as a dead man. You see, there's something about the glory of God, but he's the, there's a fatherliness to his glory. That what God wants to, to be to us, I believe as much as anything, is a father. A father. Is, is someone whom he can take the strongest saint and cause him to fall on his face, but the youngest child can run and sit on his lap. And that's what Jesus was. He was the embodiment of glory and truth. See, so when, when we talk about the glory of God, one of the things that bothers me today is God is calling us to draw near because of his fatherhood. But I, I do, I have to confess, I get a little bothered by the flippancy by which we, we seem to get excited about His glory falling. Because when we begin to experience that in its fullness, at least fullness to the degree that He'll bring, I believe we'll be flat on our faces. I believe we'll have the same experience that Daniel said, all of my beauty was turned to blackness. And Ezekiel saw this whirling, whirling, whirling tornado, beautiful flashes of fire and light and color. And he looked in and he saw 
one on a chariot like the Son of Man, and he fell on his face. God veils his glory because I don't think we can handle all of it at once. But he gives us faith to move more progressively into his glory. Am I making sense to you? See, what I'm saying is that whatever we've experienced of God, he's got something else for us to experience that's maybe not greater, but more clear, more pure than anything we've ever seen before. So every one of us in this place need to commit our lives to walking by faith, to getting to whatever he's wanting to show us. Nobody should have arrived. Nobody should be at a place where we don't need more faith to take a more clear step to know him more and more intimately. And look what he gives us. Look what he gives us. Here's what he wants. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, your spiritual eyes, so that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Now, that's the first thing that God wants us to see, the hope of his calling. Now, what would that be? You know, I, I'm convinced that God says, first of all, I want to give you a revelation of my fatherliness. I want to bring you into this thing where I open your eyes for invisibles, and I want you to know the hope of your calling. Now, Moses experienced the glory of God, and he asked God, who? Moses said, whom shall I say sent me? And what did he get? He gave him a revelation of I am who I am. Um, Job asked why. Why is all of this happening to me? Why am I going through what I'm going through? And the same process that came to the point where God opened his eyes and he said, I repent. I have heard of thee with the hearing of my ear, but now my eye sees thee. I understand. I understand things I didn't understand before. Abraham asked where? Abraham asked where? He said, where are you taking me? How many of you ever had this experience? Anybody who's ever traveled 10 miles with children in the back seat of a minivan know the experience I'm about to describe. You know, we're a lot like this sometimes. I mean, you're not even out of the driveway yet. And you hear these voices coming from the back seat. Are we there yet? I'm hungry. I have to go to the bathroom. Where are we going? And we're a lot like that with the Father. You know, we don't get very far out of the driveway and we're saying, God, are you sure this is the right way? I, I, I got, I'm, I, there must be a wrong turn that I took back there. I, I, I think I've missed you somewhere because it wouldn't be this tough. But that's why I say God is not, he's not a road map, he's a way. And, and on the way, he expects us to encounter things that are going to build and increase our faith. And he expects us to start measuring things not by comparing ourselves with ourselves or with others, but by the word, by the riches of his glory, uh, by the power of his grace. He, asks, he wants us to learn to start making choices that are different than what we're used to as if we lived in another world. And, and he says, here's what I'm going to give you. He says, I'm, I'm going to give you uh, the opportunity to relinquish control. <laughs> now, now, I believe some people think that faith is this, and, and if this is what you think it is, it's wrong. Some people think that faith is Jesus at the steering wheel, and we're locked in the trunk. Okay? Like he's not going to show you anything. But that's not the way it is. God literally wants us to see progressively along the way. Are you hearing me? So when you're faced with a situation where you don't see anything and you don't know what he's doing, don't panic. You're on a way and you may be going through a dark tunnel, but God is about to show you something about himself because you're really not on a, just a, a little road map to some place. You're on a way, a journey with him. He's taking you somewhere. And he's watching over you. Now, it doesn't matter what you've experienced. He, he says, now look at this. He says that you would know the surpassing uh, uh, excuse me, the, uh, something to enlighten us that we would know the hope of our calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now look at verse 19, because 19 has four power words that are very, very significant. He, he says in verse 19, he wants us to know this. He have our spiritual eyes open to what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who, what? Who believe. 
So if we will believe God, if we'll step out and believe God, we may not know where we're going. You may be going through a dark tunnel, as I said right now. You may be going through something that you don't, you don't really understand. But it's all right. As long as you're following after God and you keep walking and trusting Him by faith, then what He's going to do, He is going to show you the hope of your calling. And He is going to show you, He's going to show you what He's calling you for. Not the kind of hope the world has, but the kind of hope that is sure and steadfast. All right? Now, uh, it's an anticipation. He's going to build an excitement and a desire on the inside of you. If you just keep walking with Him, I don't know how many have ever experienced this, but I'm telling you, this is the way faith works. You want to know if you're off course, God's not going to keep giving you a desire when you get off course. Are you with me? You're going to lose the enlightenment and you're going to get off course. How many have ever gotten lost? You didn't know where you were going. You didn't know how you got there. But what God does is you're walking by faith, even though temporarily you cannot see anything, God is doing something on the inside of you. You start having a desire to go forward. It builds and it grows. You can't see anything yet, but you have a desire. And as you continue to go with him, he builds not only that, but an expectation. And so that's the way God directs us by faith, is we keep walking with him. Now, in order for us to stay on course, he gives us four power words. Number one, he says, according to... These are in according with the working. Uh, the word power that I talked about, his power, is the word dunamis. How many have ever heard that word? Now, what English word do we usually attribute it to? Dynamite. And did you know that that's really not the best word? Let, let me give you an example. The best word is dynamic. Now, what's the difference between dynamic and dynamite? There are some people I do not want to be in the same room with them holding a stick of dynamite and a match. There's just some people I'd rather not be with. Dynamite can blow something up constructively or destructively. There are people who somehow lock into some power of God, some gifting that they've got, whatever it is, and you've heard stories about this, and, and they get off course. And the power that they operate under ends up creating more damage to the body of Christ than it does blessing to the body of Christ. They're like, a, they're like an undependable person with a stick of dynamite and a match. They'll just pitch it out anywhere. But the word dynamic means power harnessed for a purpose. See, water that flows through a hydroelectric dam is not dynamite, it's dynamic. So when we're walking by faith, sometimes we feel like we fail, but we didn't fail at all. What God is doing is harnessing us because he's going to give us the power that we need to do what he wants us to do, but he has to harness us. And sometimes he has to deal with our will. Sometimes he deals with our expectations. Sometimes he deals with our sins, but he's going to harness you. Friend, I want to tell you something. Don't, don't just give up on something. Simply because you felt an expectation and desire growing. Now, that can be fleshly, but God will deal with that. All right. He'll harness you. How many of you have ever been harnessed by God? See, and, and then the next word that he uses is a word that says, not power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working. And the word working there, I'm reading from the New American Standard, so it reads a little different in some things. The word working has, is the word energeia which means energy. It means an effective working. God says, I'll harness you first in this walk by faith. By faith. I've heard of your faith. Now I want to give you spiritual eyes to see so you know the hope of your calling and, and you, will, you will know the inheritance that I have in you and you will know my measurement according to the riches of my glory and you will begin to walk with me in a way that I can harness you. And then I can produce an inner geia, an effective working. And then the next word that he uses, now look at this. The next word that he uses, these are in accord with the working of the strength of his might. Two more words. And that word strength, now listen to this, is the word kratos. K-R-A-T-O-S. You know, I like this because what it means is a penetrating, ruling, subduing power. See, when you step out by faith and don't look at what you see, God harnesses you. 
Now, you, you see somebody that says they're walking by faith and their life is unruly and undisciplined, they're not walking by faith. Faith harnesses you. It, I mean, it constrains you. It puts you, because God's going to put an enormous power in your hands, not for you to use indiscriminately, but to flow through you. You're not a reservoir, you're a conduit, okay? But what happens is that once you begin to step out and walk by faith, and you're not trusting in your own ability to compare yourself with yourself, something happens. The things you begin to do have a divine working energy with it that instead of bouncing off walls, penetrates the darkness. It penetrates, it subdues, it rules. You understand? So when you start exercising faith, for example, to bring your children back to the Lord, and you let him harness you and get you on that path. And you start believing not according to the ability of the people around your children or believe according to what that might happen or how that might take place. Just forget about that and realize that God's going to do it according to the riches of his glory, which is pretty vast. Then what happens as you begin to pray, your prayers start taking on a penetrating, subduing power. Are you with me? That's what faith does. That's why it's important to see by faith. Now, I want to close with one little story that I think is so important to see how God works. If I could get that in, and I, could, I just need about five or six minutes. I want you to turn with me to the Old Testament, if you would, Genesis 21. I want to use this as an example. And I want you to think about this woman by the name of Hagar. Now, Hagar, can I remind you, Hagar is not a harlot. Hagar is the maid who obeyed. Hagar is asked to do something by her master. Hagar is asked to have a baby. Sarah is her master. And she is asked to have a baby by Abraham. She, she is not a harlot. She obeys. She does what she's supposed to. Listen, sometimes when you step out by faith to trust God, it doesn't work out the way you expect it to work out. It doesn't happen the way you think it should. You obey your master and you step out and then it just like everything comes unraveled. How many have ever experienced that? You say, wait a minute, this was by faith. God, I'm, I'm, I should get something more than this. Now look what happens. Look with me. Verse 14. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar, putting them on her shoulder and gave her the boy and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. This woman obeyed, and what she got from her obedience was a flask of water and the baby. You think you've been wounded. Can you imagine what she felt? But what I want you to understand is God is going to do something for this lady. You would not expect to find faith here. You would not expect God to do this. Let me tell you something. I'm not encouraging weak faith. I'm not encouraging little faith. But I am encouraging you to look to the God of faith, the author and the finisher of your faith. And understand that if God can do this with little bit, what can he do with one who will trust him fully? What can he do with somebody who will plant their feet and just move out in God? What can he do with you? What would he raise up out of this congregation right here? What would he affect? Who would he win to the Lord? Who would he use to penetrate a place of darkness in somebody's mind and heart that nobody else could ever touch? What would he use you for? What would he do in your own family? What would he do in your own life? I'm not talking about getting stuff. I'm talking about a penetrating, subduing power to dent the kingdom of darkness. No, to penetrate it and rip it wide open. I'm convinced that God has a, a plan and an issue for every one of us to do that to the kingdom of darkness in some area. All right? Now, look at this. Here's what happens. Verse 15, And the water in the skin was used up, and she left the boy under one of the bushes. And then she went and sat down opposite him about a bow shot away for she said do not let me see the boy die and she sat opposite him and lifted up her voice and wept now I want you to hear this many of you in this room right now have had something I'm gonna call it a baby a baby of a vision a baby of a desire a baby of something that God has birthed in you and you haven't seen it come to pass 
but yet you were so confident it was God. Some of you still hanging on to the baby. Some of you have given up on it completely. I want you to see what happened. Hagar takes this baby. She finds a bush, puts him under the shade, leaves him there. She doesn't want to see him die. She walks away, about a bow shot away, and she comes over and she sits with her back to the baby. And she starts crying. Are you hearing me? She starts crying. But now notice what happens. Not only does she start crying, there's no faith in that, but the baby starts crying. Look at this, the next verse. Verse 17, and God heard the lad crying. Now, which one did God hear? Heard the baby crying. God heard the baby, the lad crying, and called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's the matter with you, Hagar? <laughs> you know, I, 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 God is incredible. He goes to a man at a well that can't get into the pool. Been there 38 years and said, Do you want to be made whole? <laughs> that guy's got to say, You got to be kidding me. <laughs> do, you, do I want to be made whole? <laughs> I try to be made whole, but somebody gets in before me. Hagar, what's the matter with you? You've got to be kidding me, God. <laughs> I'm sitting out here with no water. I've been rejected. I've been hurt. I've been abandoned. And, and I'm sitting here dying. I have no hope. I've got nothing. My baby's over there crying. And you're asking me what's wrong with me? And God says, do not fear. God's heard the voice of the lad where he is. Friend, I want to tell you something. When I got to see this, I'm not trying to over-spiritualize it. But you know what happens? I'm just going to take a couple more minutes, but listen. When you feel like your faith is dead, God is ready to give you spiritual eyes. And when he's placed something on the inside of you, if it's God that's placed it in there, that baby may be sitting under a tree, apparently dying from the natural world, but it's crying out from the inside of you that baby that God has given to birth in you, that thing God wants to do with your life, and it's still crying out on the inside of you. And God doesn't hear your unbelief. He doesn't hear your moans. He doesn't hear you giving up, but he does hear the baby's voice crying. The voice that nobody else can hear, that's so faint and so silent, because the devil and the world and circumstances have just about crushed it. And there's no voice that that natural ear can hear, but inside God hears the voice of that thing he's birthing on the inside. Are you hearing me? You may have forgotten it, but God says, I hear it. I hear it. What's the matter with you? What's wrong? Are you going to look at the circumstances? Or are you going to look at the according to's? According to the riches of my grace, according to the riches of my glory, according to the riches of my power, what are you going to look at? I hear the baby. And the moment you respond, he opens your eyes to see with spiritual eyes once again. And look what happens. Look at this. Verse 18. Arise, lift up the lad. You know what that means? That means you take that thing in you that's about to die that you thought was long gone and you begin to lift it up to the Lord. Lift up the lad. Take it by the hand. And then he says... For I will make a great nation of him. I'm not through. Look at verse 15, verse 19. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and she filled the skin with water and gave the lad to drink. Friend, I want to tell you something. Listen to me. I'm closing with this. That well didn't just poof, pop up supernaturally. God didn't create a well. The well was already there, but she was so defeated she could not see except with natural eyes until the baby began to cry out and God heard it, spoke to her and said, grab the baby, lift him up. And she opened her eyes. God opened her eyes and she saw the provision that was there all along. I believe God is speaking to some of you tonight about that very thing, that he wants to give you spiritual eyes to see again, that there's a baby of hope crying out on the inside. That God's deposited something there. And he's telling you to step out by faith and begin to trust him now. Are you hearing what I'm saying? How many of you hear what I'm saying? 
You see, it might be a little baby, it might be a big baby. I don't know how old it is. I don't know what's happened. But God is saying, the moment you begin to trust me and step out by faith, not by what you see, stop measuring according to your own self, comparing yourself with yourself or with others or with your circumstance, say, God, if that thing's real in me, then put a fresh desire and expectancy. Let me have spiritual eyes, enlighten my heart to see the hope of my calling again. Lord, that I might understand the power that's working toward me who believes. And God, open my eyes. And God will open them because he hears the cry of the baby to see the provision of the well that's right there beside you. Lord, I'm asking you in Jesus' name to give us a fresh faith and a fresh understanding. I'm asking you in this congregation that tonight with just a simple word that you'd raise up a fresh faith and a fresh hope and a fresh trust and risk to step out, God, and to move toward that baby that you've, that you've birthed within them. And Father God, if they don't know what it is, I'm asking you to open their eyes and enlighten them to see the hope of their calling and the riches of your glory, what they are as an inheritance to you and then the power by faith to step forward and to see, Lord, it might be to see somebody in their family saved, but that subduing power opened their eyes with spiritual eyes. Stop looking at the natural and look at the according to's. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.